Я всех приветствую на нашей сессии. I'd like to welcome everyone to our session. We are ready to start. I'd like to mention that if you haven't don't have special interpretation devices, because we are going to have foreign speakers, so it's better to do it right now. My name is Elia Daronov. I'm the managing director of RBK channel, and I'm going to moderate today's session. A couple of minutes, and we are ready to kick off. So we have all these speakers in place. We are going to wait for Mark Gazizulin. So I invite everyone to this stage. My name is Ilya Daronov, going to moderate today's session. We're going to talk about uh, smart districts, digital transformation of the urban environment. I'm going to introduce all these speakers. And then we'll be ready to start. We are waiting for Maras Gazulin, who is the Director General for Most Engineering Project. Here we have Laurent Bouillot, the President of Siderative Company, Vitaly Lutz, the Head of the Management Department of Institute of Master Plan, Emmanuel Forrest, the Executive Vice President of uh, Company Group Buix, and the Director General for Buix Europe, Alexei Sherbin, and the Head of the Chair for Pathology of Historical and Political Science of Tomsk State University, the Doctorate degree in political science, Jonathan Sparrow, the vice president uh, on CS and Russia, Cisco. So he promised to speak Russian, which is great pleasure for us. Maxim Birlovich, the head of Moscow Territorial Management Unit at Alon Group. So I have the question to our technical group. Can I get a clicker? Because I will need it. Hey guys, can you hear me? Where can I get a clicker for our guests? Thank you for your answer. I have a clicker. I hope the presentations will work well. So we start with uh, Laurent Bouillot. I would like to welcome you. Do you need a clicker? Here you can look at the big screen. Uh, speakers might take a look at the small screens. Prior to the session, there was a big Paris, big Moscow session. I also was a moderator. And Laurent, your company created the digital twin of big Paris. What is that? Can you give us details about this project? Doesn't work? Is it work? Okay. Okay. Great. So thank you to give me the uh, the opportunity to talk about the, this project. Uh, I don't know if the video is on. Okay. So um, before to explain this project, I would like to introduce what means smart city planning uh, and our approach. So I would like to show you uh, this video. Uh, to explain the, the approach. In the first step, we have to, uh, we say, to, to create the digital twin of the city. What it means? It's in fact to infer, to modelize with very good accuracy uh, the terrain, the geography. This is an example of project we have in France where we modelize at five centimeters in 3D the environment. This is the first layer of the digital twin. Uh, in this case, we are in uh, San Jose in, uh, in North America we're to reach one centimeter in 3D. So we need this level of accuracy to aggregate any data of the city. Here we are in Santiago in Chile. And thanks to this quality of accuracy, we can aggregate any data of the city. We can have information about the energy, uh, connectivity, uh, criminality, pollution, uh, noise, etc. So, like that, we have in fact uh, one referential of data for all stakeholders. It means, like that, we can, in virtual world, to imagine what kind of urban transformation we could imagine, and then to talk together exactly about the same uh, world in virtual. And after that, you can um, make decision. Here, for example, this is a few simulation about the air pollution, and then to see 
in any point of the city, what is the level of air pollution we could have and predict uh, regarding all the urban transformation you can decide. This is another example in, in, in Strasbourg, uh, close to the nice cathedral. We have a lot of noise with a lot of cars. And, and the idea is how can we communicate to people to explain why we should decrease the number of cars and what is the impact about the noise and the pollution and the quality of life and then at the end the attractivity of the city. So this kind of tool is very useful for all uh, to explain uh, the process that we say smart city planning. In this case, we present also the uh, energy efficiency of buildings. With a car like this one, we can survey a city and then estimate the level of uh, energy consuming of any buildings and also um, uh, prioritize which building could be uh, improved in the energy efficiency. Now let's come back to the project we have in, uh, in France and with uh, Région Île-de-France. Uh, Région Île-de-France uh, decided to provide a smart city platform for citizens to provide services. This is one first services to provide uh, the solar potential uh, for any rooftop of all uh, great Île-de-France. We have 2.5 million of buildings that we modelize in 3D and then for each building, we can estimate how many uh, kilowatt hour we can gain, what is the decrease of uh, energy pollution, CO2 print, and, and uh, if we are very close or not to a nice building. An another service we, 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 we start is smart work. As you know, mobility is, is a real issue, and the idea, and tomorrow, we have not only to think, uh, of course, to work, but not only to also to see where we could work. Not only at the office, but also, for example, in a, a, a metro station, close to the metro station, etc. So we can help people to select uh, which place makes sense for them uh, to realize some, uh, some work. That's uh, um, an example of, in fact, new services we can provide. So we are at the very beginning of this project with uh, Great Paris, and we plan next, next year to provide 50 different services for all people, not only um, uh, citizens, but also investors. And as you see here, we have aggregated more than uh, 800 layers of different information aggregated in only one database uh, open to uh, citizen. Th that's the very beginning of this project, quite huge. I think it's one of the biggest uh, smart city service platform for citizens in the world today. Started uh, six months ago and we hope to finalize this project uh, within four years. I'd like to apologize because the timing is very strict. So every speaker has about five to six minutes. So I will be tough in terms of keeping up with the timings. Right now we have Margaret Zezulin with us, the uh, Director General for Moss and Energy Project. So hello, I'd like to give the floor to you about the transport, about the smart city, how to arrange this transport. So the curriculum is yours, don't hesitate to use it. Smart city has a very important part in terms of transport infrastructure as for every city, particularly for big cities, agglomerations. It is important to have a mobility of the citizens, the access to services, to the areas. Therefore, the important role is attached to the transport, social and engineering infrastructure. And the success rests on those cities which start to provide for the advanced development of this transport frame in order to shape and develop the city based on that. 
in the table you can see the amount of underground stations, the uh, millage of the underground network, and the impact on the cities. Our company participates in the program for the development of underground system in Moscow. And we see that, as of today, Moscow has very high place in terms of the mileage and the passenger traffic for our underground system, the pressure is really high. Most injured projects started in 2011, the program for the underground development, and over this period of time, Moscow has seen, starting from 2011 to 2019, 50 stations launched. This just exceeds the previous periods. If we take the last year as an example, there was a record over the whole period of time in terms of the new building construction, 17 underground stations and three depots were launched. And today, thanks to gradual work on designing, advanced designing at advanced pace, we're planning to build another 50 underground stations till 2023 and uh, half annual pace of 8 to 10 underground stations launched. This year we have launched four underground stations of Nekrasovska underground line and uh, four other stations in open mode. So. For this year, we have launched already eight underground stations, and by the end of the year, we are planning to launch another six underground stations, which we expect to finalize by the end of the year, and to start its operation by the beginning of the next year. So they are at very high stage of finalization. So development of uh, underground stations and new lines If we take the Comunarca station, the actual lines, so Moscow is building underground stations into those districts of the cities, which will give, which will be a very good platform for new residential housing building and for the comfortable environment for the citizens of Moscow. Thank you very much. So if you take a look at uh, Olikhoba stations, and there is a field surrounding this station. We do understand that it's going to be a huge development of the area. Now I'd like to give the floor to the master plan project. Mr. Lutz, the head of the perspective uh, projects of uh, master plan of Moscow. So the floor is yours. I have only one slide. I don't need to use the clicker. You're going to speak at length about this slide. So, dear colleagues, I would like to draw your attention to a very interesting phenomenon which has been witness, witnessed over the last period of time, and we are all witnesses of this. There is a transformation of the suburban areas of Moscow. You know, the renovation program, it's a buzzword right now. It's been widely discussed. Many aspects and features of this program are being discussed. Sometimes there is a heated debate over that. But what we have missed, I'm going to draw attention to that. In fact, in the suburbs, we see the, in particular in the renovation areas, a new frame of public space. Talking about the city, we Remember the center of Moscow, the center of the city, where we understand what the city looks like. Sometimes we do not correlate the city to the suburbs of the cities. So these are not the ideas in our mind when we speak about the city. But right now, thanks to the renovation, it creates a new phenomenon, the so-called frame of public spaces, which didn't used to be found in the suburban and bedroom districts of the cities. So people just slept there and uh, went to the center to work. So we 
see, thanks to the new technologies, the analysis of big data, we have worked out the latest projects in our public space and which were still to expect. On this slide, you can see the vivid example. The left bar is what existed in terms of the public spaces. On the right bar, you can see a new frame of public spaces. This is a cornerstone. So this is not the area for the residential blocks. This is always the zone for the free access, the, the area for active life, for entrepreneurs, implementation of new neighborhoods, formats, which was not in place in USSR. This is a platform for to shape a new type of neighborhoods. Not talking about uh, penetration, density, connectivity. So you can see that it didn't used to be found, but now it is emerging. So we evaluated in percentage. We provided our colleagues with the data matrix, the analyze of the big data. And they are quite vivid. So the bottom, this is the growth of public spaces inside these bedroom suburban areas and districts. So the city is moving to these bedroom districts. We analyze that based on the examples of renovations. And the whole program of renovation is very important in our particular enterprise and institution is responsible for a big number of these projects. We do regenerate this data, we do analyze this data. On the right bar, the idea of the general architect of Moscow, Mr. Kuznetsov, jointly with uh, his department, we carried out these investigations comparing the environment parameters of renovation programs compared with the European similar projects. And we see the trend in place. On the left, what it used to be. On the right, what we are expect to see in the future. In the middle, the information on the projects developed. That is our current state of affairs right now. This is a very important shift, like a tectonic shift. If we're talking about new formats of a comfortable living space, we cannot but look into this project. Why do we need the, this demand for such a public space? Why couldn't we build as in USSR? We see that the building is in place, but we're talking about the greater importance or to attach to this phenomenon, which it might have, which it possesses. This is about connectivity. This is about penetration, and it is very important to mention the psychological factor, the articulation of psychological and private, which makes the city. The citizen understands, the resident of the city understands that this is my flat, this is my park, this is a public space, and this is a red square which belongs to everyone in the country. This quaint reflection of the space is quite vivid and legally stated. Say shaping this system, we stipulate strict rules, we stipulate borders, we have codes in our documents, and it shouldn't have any buildings in this public space. So that's why this is the place for new public life. So it's a good thing that people can live as they get used to, or to select a new area for their life. It is very important that in these bedroom districts we now have this choice because it didn't used to exist before. Thank you very much. Foreign experience, Emanuele Forest, uh, Bui company, which has been working in digital technologies. The example of Dijon City is quite well known. Could you speak about this project and about the technologies you use? Thank you very much. I'm not a representative of Puig. We started to work in Russia in USSR times. Therefore, we had a lot of projects in Russia and 
Hyatt uh, Hotel in Yekaterinburg now we are preparing the systems of light alarm systems jointly with air company and the lines is not like in Yekaterinburg Hotel as a secure mobility. This is the motto of our future projects for weak company. My topic is the city have Dijon City. First of all, I'd like to quote geotechnology. The beam. Well, first of all, I would like to talk about so the BMI technology or building information modeling. This is the way, of course, to manage any construction project, but it also gives us an opportunity to create a digital twin. That is something that, of course, is very useful for companies, but I also believe that in the future it will improve the maintenance of our buildings because this modeling system provides us with a digital list of all of the components and maintenance services. And the second technology that I wanted to mention is, of course, blockchain. We have a very interesting project in Yum, where we created an environmental district that uses renewable sources for electricity people who live in this district, uh, they use this environmentally friendly electricity for their residential areas. It is also used in office areas. But I also know that um, Moscow has started an experiment to use uh, blockchain technologies to register uh, real estate to deal with the taxes. We only have a limited experience with that, but I believe it, it is a very important technology. Now I would like to tell you a little bit about Dijon. In Dijon, we have a smart system of street lighting. We have a smart grid, so we do not needs to build a new grid so we can use an internet signal and we can use each lighting pole in the city to install things like Wi-Fi, CCTV, sound, animation. We also have a central hypervisor of all of the municipal services. What is a smart city? It is digitalization of urban services that improves the quality of life of all of the people living in the city. I would like to give you an example of our hypervisor of municipal services. Let's imagine there is an accident, a traffic accident that happens in the street, then every citizen who sees an accident happening can use their uh, smartphone to report the traffic accident to the hypervisor so that we can block off a street, so we can open up traffic on other streets, we can change the way the traffic lights work, and we can also inform the public that uh, there's been an accident, so the, a particular traffic route has been closed off. We cooperated with partners uh, such as EDF, Suez, Capgemini, so we utilized a completely new approach for our company, but this approach is also new for the urban administration. All of the departments had to cooperate together. We used to have the traffic department, the safety departments, and they all functioned autonomously. But now they have to work together. They have to share the same budget, they have to become efficient for the city overall. So this is my last slide, so the past and the future. We do not have anything that looks like the active citizen app that you have in Moscow. And I think 
that uh, the mayor of Moscow also said that they're thinking about using blockchain uh, for this app. I believe that a smart city is an open city and an app like this is very important for an open government. Thank you very much. We have such fantastic speakers um, with us uh, today that uh, you're all really mindful of the time. We have a colleague from uh, Tomsk, Andrei Shambinin, head of the Department of World Politics, Faculty of Historical and Political Studies, National Research University in Tomsk. I would like to ask you about uh, smart society, living labs, how are the new technologies uh, tested? Thank you very much, distinguished colleagues. I would like, if you don't mind, to uh, tell you about Krzysztof Novratik who wrote an absolutely fantastic book, which is called City as a Political Idea. This book is not really well known now, but I do believe that in about three years, people will discover this book the same way that the book Smart Cities has been discovered. So what he writes in his book is that this uh, digital saturation of cities is a thing of the past. And if the government wants to own its idea, it should work not with technologies, but rather with mean meanings. I would like to remind you the, um, the report of Manuel Castells that he delivered in the Stanford University. His report was called Russia a Digital Society. In his report, he so quoted a story about the Russian Revolution. That story is said that back in the 1970s, the Bolsheviks, they didn't seize power, but rather they seized the meaning. So we're talking not about a coup, but we're talking about the seizure of meaning. When the meaning is seized, an idea becomes successful. Today we are all at the urban forum, which is a testament to the fact that we have become part of the revolution, the tech revolution, which is also entwined with the issue of meaning. All of the speakers uh, talked about human beings, about training human beings, about uh, using technologies in the city to turn a city into a living university for its citizens. Why is this important? Well, because all of the great institutions that were relevant during the industrial age, institutions such as the government, the family, all of these institutions are becoming more and more abstract. These great institutions and great ideas are something that uh, Berger and Lockman called the living world. So if we utilize this concept, it will truly explain the relevance of all of the new technologies. What I'm trying to say is that when I'm talking about a smart city, we have a triage of smart cities, smart government and smart technologies. Not a single one of these elements will be efficient on its own, but together they will bring us a lot of prospects. So we really have to work and apply our efforts at all levels. Our session today is quite disruptive. We're talking about smart districts and what's important about this revolution is that it is carried out by architects. It is carried out by city planners. We have to put meaning into everything because the meaning is becoming as important as concrete, steel and construction. The second thing which is very important is that politicians always follow smart people. So you shouldn't give them an 
opportunity to reduce all of these motors until they lose all meaning. We should all go back to the core meaning of things. So when we talk about smart cities or public spaces, we have to remember the meaning behind it. And I think today everyone in Russia has gone completely crazy about smart cities and public spaces. But a smart city or a public space that is not tied to any idea is an empty space where people walk their dogs, play with their kids, but nothing more than that. If you remember the times in the Soviet Union, we had special public spaces where stamp collectors would meet, where hippies would meet, where people who collected coins would meet together. So these spaces were like the public forum. We have to bring back the meaning. We have to introduce it back. And again, a living lab is a very abused term. It has become a buzzword. But a living lab can test drive almost any concept, including transportation concepts. I don't want to say whether it was IBM or Cisco who first started using the term smarter cities. So today we have to talk about lab, labs that are even more alive. So the project uh, that Guggenheim and BMW launched in 2011, which was a survey that um, had been performed for two months, and they asked the citizens of New York what it is that they are interested in. Then they asked people in Mumbai, people in Berlin. So they were trying to reveal the signals that were quite weak, the signals that would tell us how everything will develop in, this, um, in the future. You can look at the Manchester project, which is called the city of wisdom. It's not a smart city, but it's a city that has wisdom. The city teaches itself. It's become both an offline and an online platform. I think that is something for the future. Well, before we give the floor to a speaker who knows a lot about technologies, do you agree that all of the public spaces have to have meaning? I absolutely agree with that. Who could argue with a statement like this? Of course, we are looking at a problem from different sides, but in order to bring me meaning we have to have a physical structure that the meaning will be tied to. Thank you very much. We have Jonathan Sparrow, Vice President in Russia and CIS of Cisco. That was just mentioned. Um, Mr. Sparrow, which technologies are now coming into cities? Can we call them new technologies? Thank you very much, Ilya. Firstly, I would like to congratulate my fellow citizens of the United States on the Independence Day. Well, you know, right after this session, I'm going to the American Embassy to congratulate everybody. Hey, I can give you a lift. Well, that's very nice. So I would like to thank my colleagues from France, who also played an important part in American Revolution, merci beaucoup. And so Russia, by the way, the Russian Empire also played a role in America becoming independent. So I would like to thank all of my Russian friends here. But let's talk about technology. When we are talking about cities, we always mention digital infrastructure. So what is a superstructure when we talk about a digital infrastructure? Well, these are apps, the services. Infrastructure is a business area, but of course, without infrastructure, we cannot have any digital services, digitalization. We have to have smart data transfer grids. We have to have processing and 
store, data storage centers. And what's also important is that we have to have a very good cyber security. Without that, nothing would be possible. And of course, you all know that Cisco is a global leader when it comes to data transfer. We play an active part and a lot of projects, but of course we are primarily interested in infrastructure. We see a lot of new services appear, we see a lot of innovations, mushroom. What does it do for a city? When well, we have all of these technologies, a city can react to any sort of incidents very promptly. It can react uh, to um, natural disasters, floodings, and so on and so forth. A city can use uh, technologies uh, to shift from the financial capex model to a service-based capex model. But I would like to emphasize two things that are very important for smart cities. Just as my colleague has said, um, we generate a lot of data in the digital um, age. We have the data sea, we have uh, data oceans. I've never heard about data puddles, but everybody's talking about data seas and data oceans. You know, the human mind cannot possibly process, it cannot possibly analyze these enormous data sets. Therefore, artificial intelligence is coming more and more to the foreground when it comes to the developments of smart cities. The support of the Russian government that is enjoyed by a lot of startups is usually financial support. So the government provides funding for office spaces, it provides legal support, marketing support. What the thing that startups really need are projects. When it comes to artificial intelligence, Russia has a lot of human capital in startups. Therefore, cities and also the federal government should give support to startups in terms of uh, projects. Of course, uh, solutions like these they exist in Europe and Singapore, but we would like to see a Russian um, solution. So. On the Independence Day, I really like the phrase that you used that here in Russia we would like to have Russian solutions. It is interesting coming from an American citizen. Well, I am in Russia now, so let America have American uh, solutions and we will have Russian solutions in Russia. I'll talk to you privately during the Independence Day uh, celebrations, but let me continue. What's also interesting is an platform that allows the exchange of information between uh, different uh, departments in business, just like in governments. Departments are like isolated silos. So we all have our databases, we all have our work models. We are really reluctant to share. But let me give you an interesting example. In one southern European city, they were looking into garbage collection. And you would think that garbage collection is quite straightforward. You can plan the routes of garbage trucks. You can utilize RFID tags uh, to see the amount of garbage that is stored in garbage bins. But um, everything seems quite all right on the surface. But sometimes we can have hot summers. And what becomes more important than the volume of garbage is the actual smell or the proliferation of bacteria, and that is something that would be in the purview of the environmental departments and not so the garbage collection department. So if these two departments share the information, they could become much more efficient. So this problem has been solved in this uh, South European city, and it is a very illustrative example of how important it is to get out of the silo and share the information between departments. Thank you very much.
I would like uh, to give the floor to Maxim Berlovich, who is the director of uh, the Atalon Group in Moscow. So we would like to talk about smart technologies. What kind of technologies do you use and what kind of experience can you share with us? Thank you very much. I'll be about, I'll be brief in outlining the pro, uh, problems that influence the rates of penetration of smart technologies, including building information modeling. I can give you an example of uh, my company, and we're building whole districts in St. Petersburg in Moscow. We see that the volume of investments in research and development and construction is very low. Uh, our company is just reaching 0.2 percentage of uh, cost to revenue. So telecom companies and IT companies, when it comes to R&D, they spend up to 0.5 percent of their revenue on R&D. So today we can focus how fast the technology is going to penetrate in the building industry, seeing how the building companies uh, regard research and development strategy. Not all the companies can afford to do that. We're working with BAM Technologies starting in 2012, and the volume of investment is going up. But the next obstacle after the first problem is resolved, that uh, R&D and innovations are important, we have an obstacle of the sustainable development and the reasonable application of these technologies among our clients. As of today, our clients do not always share the idea of the separated uh, garbage collection, which is directly connected with the smart technologies, energy efficiency, uh, air pollution, the energy consumption. And it starts to shift by the reasonable consumption among our clients and reasonable application of these technologies among our residents is not at that high level compared with the European countries. The same is true about the business. When we are talking about the sustainable development in business sector, about the environmental issues, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, the garbage and waste processing. So these questions should be a part of the business strategy. Apart from that, we see that uh, there is uh, not simultaneous development of digital and information transformations and legal framework. Based on the example of our company, creating this information BM model, putting content insight, we launch the building blocks and would like to send these 3D models to these operating organizations for the block of flats after this block of flat is launched. But we can do it only after we assign this house to our own operating company. But we cannot give guarantees that this operating company is going to be provided by Etalon Group, as today the population is responsible for voting on this operator for their house. So today, there is some restriction limitations on the personal cars. There are uh, tall car parking lots, but for developers, there are no incentives to reduce the parking lots. A good example in London, Mona Foster building 41 floor, 50,000 square kilometers, only 20 parking lots. And when we are looking into developing projects in London today, so the city understand that it is necessary to reduce these parking lots as an incentive to reduce the number of cars used. Therefore, there is not simultaneous development of digital technologies and legal framework, but on the other hand, participation in strategic meetings of the Ministry of Development and Construction, we see that among 10 key KPIs, environment, penetration of BAM, technologies in building sector and the indicators connected with the environmental protections were singled out. So in the previous strategy of the Ministry of uh, Construction and Development, those ideas were not mentioned. So at both state and business levels, these technologies are penetrating, but then it's supported by the investment in R&D and the legal framework should be shaped in order to improve those standards, which would allow the companies to develop these new technologies. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to give the floor to the experts which we have as of today. 
Christian Petker, the director for the development a plus C transport project. So the floor is yours. I would like to add that the public space is developing. It is limited. We'll look at that from the perspective of transport development. We've been working more than 10 years in Russia, and when we want to use this transport space as effective as possible, it is necessary to have rational planning. We see these wide roads of the USSR times, but planning of the road network cannot be implemented compared with the previous approach. We need to have the size which we need today. So we have seen the models of housing development over the last 10 years. So-called transport planning and regulation models have been developing over the last 10 years in Russia. And so based on these modeling technologies, we would want to forecast what area we need in order to provide for a transport network. And there is another layer emerging. We used to think about different means of transport, public transport, pedestrians, cars, but as in real life, it is not quite an interesting approach to the citizen. So the resident wants to have a comfortable means of transportation at all layers and would like to have a very safe and secure means of transport. So the task of the state is to provide for this transport access using by any means of transport which is most optimal for a resident. I'd like to add this territorial development. Thank you very much. I'd like to give the floor to Anna Kurbatova, who is responsible for quite wide projects. A group of our company developed the environmental frame, also called ecological frame of Moscow five years ago, which was a big program under the auspices of the government. As of today, we are developing a huge number of projects of developing public spaces um, ordered by the Moscow government for renovation areas and for the areas and the districts which are not going to have renovation, but people will definitely like to live better. So how to turn the city into a smart city? And we are talking about the demand for the public space. We need to imply that those public spaces will be filled with uh, animals, with fresh water, with fresh air. Apart from people, I'd like to thank Maxim for his idea that this program is going to be inside the federal program. Based on this criteria, we're going to assess the level of these public spaces inside the smart city. As for the necessary required investment in the R&D, this is a very outstanding issue as of today, as the terms for planning are quite limited. And we are working as we used to work in the past. From the perspective of architectural engineering issues, we have accumulated a great experience. We have shared this experience with our uh, foreign partners as well. The nature which I'm quite concerned about, which should be an element of this public space. This is our personal task, since we need to look into the Moscow story as the climate and geographical conditions. The nature is quite regional. And as of today, we need to learn planning smart districts to get back our birds, to have grass and the meaning which we need to put inside. We are going to see tourists, we are going to have children as we will feel this smell of flowers but not some images of dying trees in the puddles. Thank you very much. Our time is up. We didn't have enough, unfortunately. It's a very interesting discussion. I do hope that over this year we got smarter, we found the meanings. I'd like to 
congratulate on the day of independence of the USA. Those who relate to that and dear speakers and guests, thank you for your visit in our session.